Monster Professor. Welcome to The Monster Professor, a show in which we discuss and explore monsters in literature, myth, film, games, folklore, culture, and beyond. I'm your host, Josh Woods, author, editor, professor, and monster expert. Just one quick housekeeping item to note, Uh, the Monster Professor episodes are going to start coming out once every two weeks. They were coming out once every week, and we're moving for a while at least to once every two weeks for a few reasons. Uh, One of those reasons being I have another audio project in the works. Um, Another one, believe it or not, is that some of the listeners were saying that they were having a hard time keeping up weekly on uh, 40-50 minute episodes, and that actually is quite a lot of podcasting time to listen to within a week. And so, at least for a while, maybe you'll have a little bit of chance to catch up on all the previous episodes that you might have missed. None of the reasons for moving to two weeks, however, include a lack of monsters to talk about. If anything, there are more and more uh, lining up on the slate to come and some really good episodes planned. So stay tuned. I think those are going to be a lot of fun. So for our episode today, I want to talk about monstrous birds. This is Thanksgiving Day week, or Thanksgiving week, and as you know, in the United States of America, it's also known as Turkey Day. I don't say that entirely flippantly. Uh, You just Google search Turkey Day, and you have over 13 million results just with that phrase, Turkey Day, and believe it or not, it's in the Oxford English Dictionary as meaning Thanksgiving Day in the United States, and the Oxford English Dictionary cites the earliest usage of Turkey Day to mean Thanksgiving um, in print at 1870 in Connecticut. Uh, and they call it Turkey Day in a publication, uh, in the, um, in the newspaper publication in 1870. And so once it makes it into the OED, it's a word and we're stuck with it one way or another. And so what better week to talk about birds and in my case, of course, monstrous birds. So there are a lot of cool ones to get to. I know you probably have in mind something like the Phoenix. I want to get to that one in a minute. Um, I want to start off, however, with one of my favorite monstrous birds, the Ziz. The Ziz. Have you heard of the Ziz before? It's from Jewish folklore. You might have heard of, and you know from the Old Testament, Behemoth and Leviathan. And although those, especially in Job, show up named but kind of vague, although they get some interesting descriptions, it's not quite clear where they fit in uh, to the animals of the world or into the whole uh, cosmos. But um, a lot of extra biblical folklore and specifically Jewish folklore uh, fills in a lot of those gaps. And in Jewish folklore, Behemoth is essentially the paragon of land animals. He's huge. He's the ferocious king of all land animals. Everything a land animal can be, uh, no matter what type of animal it is, it all comes together in the body of the behemoth. But as the behemoth is to land, the leviathan is to water. And uh, in Jewish folklore, it says that both fish and birds were created on the same day. And so you have this gigantic creature of the sea, Leviathan, you have the giant one of the earth, Behemoth, and those are mentioned in the Old Testament. But there must be one for the air, right? And then that's where the Ziz comes in. So I want to read to you a description of this amazing creature um, from um, 
a, a classic and, and, and fascinating series of books on Jewish folklore um, by a scholar named Lewis Ginsberg. And he talks about creation and where these giant paragon monsters beings come in. He says, On the same day with the fishes, the birds were created. For those two kinds of animals are closely related to each other. Fish are fashioned out of water, and birds out of marshy ground saturated with water. (laughs) Just so you know. That's the science behind it. And so... uh, He continues, as Leviathan is king of the fishes, so the Ziz is appointed to rule over birds. By the way, I should have mentioned Ziz is Z-I-Z. That's how you spell his name. All right, so the Ziz... Uh, the Ziz is a, is a monstrous size, uh, as monstrous as the Leviathan himself. His ankles rest on the earth. His head reaches to the very sky. It once happened that travelers on a vessel noticed a bird. As he stood in the water, it merely covered his feet, and his head knocked against the sky. The the onlookers thought the water could not have any depth at that point, and they prepared to take a bath there. A heavenly voice warned them, quote, A light not here. Once, a carpenter's axe slipped from his hand at this spot, and it took it seven years to touch the bottom, end quote. So the heavenly voice was like, hey, watch out, there's, uh, let me tell you a story about how deep this water is, the axe. Okay, sorry. And so it continues, the bird the traveler saw was none other than the Ziz. His wings are so huge that unfurled, they darken the sun. They protect the earth against storms of the south. Without their aid, the earth would not be able to resist the winds blowing thence. Once, an egg of the Ziz fell to the ground and broke. The fluid from it flooded sixty cities, and the shock crushed three hundred cedars. Fortunately, such accidents do not occur frequently. <laughs> As a rule, the bird lets her egg slide gently into her nest. This one mishap was due to the fact that the egg was rotten and the bird cast it away carelessly. The Ziz has another name, Renanin, because he is the celestial singer. On account of his relation to the heavenly regions, he is also called Sequi, the seer, and besides, he is called Son of the Nest because his fledgling birds seek uh, his fledgling birds break away from the shell without being hatched by the mother bird they spring directly from the nest as it were like a leviathan so ziz is a delicacy to be served to the pious at the end of time to compensate them for the privations which abstaining from the unclean fowls imposed upon them by the way, I should add, uh, the promise to be able to get to eat the ziz after death uh, that the, the faithful get as a reward, uh, that's not limited to just the ziz. Uh, the faithful or those who keep the covenant in the afterlife, this is obviously much, much later, uh, ne- completely non-biblical, uh, much later folklore because the, er- the early Old Testament um, didn't really have so much a theology with an afterlife so that you can tell this is much later, but so the, uh, the, those who keep the covenant in the afterlife, uh, they will get to feast not only on the Ziz, who is so large that everyone could feast for all time, but they also get to feast on Leviathan and Behemoth. And on top of that, before they get to feast on Leviathan and Behemoth, whose meat it tastes wonderfully, I think, uh, according to some of the texts, they they get to watch Leviathan versus Behemoth in a gladiatorial match to make up for the fact that those who were pious in life never went to gladiator matches, and so they missed out on all that fun, and so all that fun is going to come back and they get to watch this huge battle to the death, and then they get to eat both of the competitors, <laughs> and so that's what that's what your reward in paradise gets to be, these huge gladiators. Uh, 
gladiatorial pro wrestling matches in which you get to eat the competitors once they're done performing for you. But the Ziz, man, talk about a fascinating, bizarre creature. Like, no sooner do they describe how big it is, like his foot is the the water that is so deep that it takes seven days for an axe to fall from the surface down to the bottom uh that's just this the height of the ziz's feet the water only gets up to his ankles his head is on the sky or her head i suppose because it lays eggs right and <laughs> the eggs one egg flooding 60 so that's just fascinating um so the concept of what makes this bird fascinating or monstrous is its enormous size. That's nothing new, of course. In fact, some of you might already be thinking of the rock, R-O-C, among different spellings um, that shows up in some of the Sinbad tales. That is a, essentially it's an eagle that's just been way, way oversized. So it's this gigantic eagle. And that started over uh, much farther east in China and then kind of moved through the Middle East and eventually kind of worked its way all the way into, um, into European kind of literature and myth. But one interesting point about this rock, though, is that it shows up in the travel journals of Marco Polo. And there it said um, that they learn about this bird who is so big that it will swoop down upon elephants and grab one in each of its talons and take it back to its eyrie and feed it to its young. And so it's not that it's so big that it snatches up elephants for food. It's that it uses elephants to feed its hatchlings. That's how freaking big this rock is. Um, it shows up in uh, 1001 Nights or Arabian Nights. Uh, uh, a side note, a fascinating feature about that famous series of books is that uh, that some of the most famous stories we have out of that uh, not only were kind of takeoffs of other older stories, for instance, there's not much separating Sinbad, the story of Sinbad from the story of the Odyssey, except that uh, instead of Odysseus, his name is Sinbad, and there's a rock. And that's uh, just about the only significant differences, uh, other than kind of the, the cultural overlay of just assuming that they look different and kind of talk differently. Um, and what's another another famous one that people know of is, is, of course, Aladdin and the Magic Lamp. But that wasn't in the original Arabic uh, Arabian Night, uh, Thousand and One Night Tales. The uh, European translator of those tales decided to create a story of his, his own that was a whole lot like those tales and just slide it in there and not tell anyone that that wasn't in the original. And he also kind of uh, promoted that one as well since it was his. And then that's how that one got famous. And so the, sto the story kind of goes that every translator of Thousand and One Nights actually adds his or her own extra tale in there and just slides it in and doesn't let anyone know. Um, Borges, <laughs> Jorge Borges one time uh, uh, said or made the challenge, I don't know if it was just a proclamation or a challenge, he said, no one alive has read all of the Thousand and One Nights tales. Um, and he said many people have read many of them, but no one has read all of them. Um, and that's a bizarre thing to say, but I have to admit, I am aware of a lot of scholars, and I know a handful of scholars, and I don't know anybody who knows anybody who has read all of them. Uh, so I thought that was interesting. Oh, speaking of Borges, um, he brings up... Um, the most interesting version of this kind of vague, um, well, I don't, I'm not vague, a mysterious type of monstrous bird called the Simurg. Um, um, there's 
probably a hundred percent chance that I'm pronouncing that wrong, but it kind of looks to me like the Simurg. Um, that thing shows up all over the place. I think originally it came from Iran, uh, that it was a, an Islamic, uh, folk piece of Islamic folklore and, and probably, um, pre-Islamic Arabic. Uh, but it shows up even in Flaubert's, uh, Temptation of St. Anthony, which kind of ends up being a bit of a monster encyclopedia as well. Um, but Borges, I mean, there are a bunch of different stories about it, but Borges relates one of them uh, that's that's fascinating. And I don't know how much of this he actually um, added to, uh, like he accuses uh, the Ar- Arabian Nights uh, translators of doing, but his goes like this. Okay, so there are these... Uh, these thousands of birds in China, right? And in China, one day, one of the splendid feathers of the Simurg falls. The Simurg is king of the birds. His bird, I mean, his name means just 30 birds. And that's about all of the regular old birds in China know of his name. And so in, but I mean, this bird, this king of the birds, the Simurg is missing. And all they find one day is one of his splendid feathers. And they take this as a sign because they're so tired of their present state of like this kingless anarchy. They want to find the king to bring him back and to unite him. And so they know very little about him. They just know that his name translates to 30 birds and they know that his palace is in the mountains of Kof, the mountains that encircle the earth. And so that all the birds in China decide to go on this pilgrimage. So what are they? Millions of them, I guess. Um, so they go on this pilgrimage flight toward the mountains at the end of the earth. And on the way, some of the birds, a lor- large portion of them go think, uh, well, this is stupid. We're just going back to our nests and doing our normal life. And so they give up. Uh, A large portion of them uh, continue on, but as the trials of their pilgrimage get worse, some of them turn cowardly, and then they run away in fear. Um, The uh, the nightingale excuses itself from this journey quest because of its love for the rose. Uh, The parrot, because of its love for its own beauty. Uh, which is the reason it still lives within the cage. The partridge says, I'm, I'm quoting this now, the partridge says it cannot live without the high mountains, while the heron pleads its need for the marshes, the owl for ruins. But at last the birds undertake the desperate quest. They cross the seven wadis, or the seven seas. The penultimate of these is called vertigo. The last annihilation. Many pilgrims, these birds, by the way, many of them abandon the quest. Others perish on the journey. At the end, 30 birds, purified by their travels, come to the mountain on which the Simurg lives, and they contemplate their king at last. They see that they are the Simurg, and that the Simurg is each of them and all of them. Isn't that cool? <laughs> that's awesome. And that's a very and that's so much a Borges style of story that, you know, he might have added to that a little bit. But others observe that uh this Samarg is is quite a bit like the Phoenix. Um so we should mention we should mention a few things about the Phoenix, I think. The Phoenix shows up all over the place, of course, and you've got uh, plenty of reason to believe that that started in the Far East and kind of made its way west. Um, It shows up, although you might have a a version of the Bible that mentions the Phoenix. It doesn't show up in the King James, in the 1611 King James version, but in a lot of Catholic versions, it does show up like uh, Job. Uh, 29:18 says, "I would say in the in my nest I shall die, and like the phoenix extend my days." Um, and uh, let's see, in uh, Psalms 92, uh, just the just man will flourish like a phoenix. 
Um, I, I, that's a different translation as well. And so it pops in there every now and then. The general story of the phoenix, and it shows up, of course, in Egypt and and the uh, Arabian countries, uh, in China, in the in the in China, much farther east as well, um, and now all over the place. The general story of the phoenix is that it's this mystical bird, somehow associated with the sun, although older stuff associates it with spices as well, um, and absolutely associated with fire. Sometimes it seems red like fire, sometimes it's made out of fire, sometimes just its wings, but uh, this phoenix will, in general, um, find its nest toward the end of its life, whether that's once every day in some tales, or once every thousand years, or 10,000 years, or 777 years, and it will make a pyre of its nest, or just nest down and start its own nest on fire. Anyway, it will engulf itself in flames, burn it down to nothing but the ashes, and then will rise back up out of it. Depending on the details, maybe all it leaves is an egg, and then that egg hatches, and then the next generation rises out of the ashes that the old generation um, created by you know, burning itself up in this great, amazing, mystical conflagration. Um, but sometimes it's that this thing never dies. It just burns itself down and renews itself. It ends up being a fascinating kind of image of, of death and renewal, but all with this fiery life in it. Um, <clears throat> I think one of the one of the most interesting places where the phoenix shows up is in this apocryphal apocalypse, the uh, the apocalypse of Baruch, uh, attributed uh, to the secretary of the prophet Jeremiah, seventh century B.C. Uh, I think it's it might be more likely that it was actually written uh, in the early early A.D.s. Um, but and attributed to a much earlier writer, but uh, in this in this uh, um, in this apocalypse or in this revelation, uh, Baruch is shown by an archangel these visions of heaven as he's weeping over the destruction of Jerusalem, and then among in these in these visions among them he sees this giant bird, and. Um, and it says, let's see, this translation, uh, I want to read a little bit of it to you. By the way, this translation comes from this amazing uh, book that's highly scholarly and full of uh, uh, all sorts of fantastic primary sources. It's called uh, The Book of Fabulous Beasts, and it's separate from and different from the uh, the Harry Potter spinoffs uh, that are kind of popular right now. This one came out in, what, was it 99? Um, <clears throat> yeah, in 99, this came out from Oxford University Press. Um, yeah, this isn't like uh, necessarily fiction or for entertainment. Uh, this is uh, a full-on scholarly work about fabulous beasts throughout literature and myth. Um, maybe not as much monster focused as I tend to be, but I think there's so much crossover that it's a must read for anybody interested in this ep in this uh, show. And this is uh, put together by the scholar Joseph Nigg. Um, I call myself the monster professor, but I think it would only, in, in fact, be like, I would be like fifth down on the line if we were going to add up the real living monster professors, because I think he's the top dog. Um, and, and, and believe it or not, he has listened uh, to the monster professor and has had uh, wonderful things to say about it. So I very much appreciate that. So if you're still listening, sir, thank you very much. I'm about to read from uh, your book and a translation that you put in there. And so Baruch sees this phoenix in the heavens and he says, As he expanded his wings, I saw on his right wing very large letters, as large as the space of a threshing floor the size of about 4,000 modi, and the letters were of gold. And the angel said to me, Read them. And I read them, and they ran thus, Neither earth nor heaven bring me forth, but wings of fire bring me forth. And I said, Lord, what is this bird? What is his name? And the angel said to me, His name is called Phoenix. And I said, What does he eat? 
And he said to me, The manna of heaven and the dew of earth. And I said, What does the bird excrete? <laughs> That's the second, the third thing he wants to know. What is his name? What is he eaten? What is he excrete? Sorry, back into it. He said, and I said, What does the bird excrete? And he said to me, He excretes a worm, and the excrement of the worm is cinnamon. And while he was conversing with me, there was a thunderclap, and the place was shaken on which we were standing. And I asked the angel, my Lord, what is this sound? And the angel said to me, even now the angels are opening the 365 gates of heaven and the light is being separated from the darkness. And a voice came which said, light giver, give the world radiance. And when I heard the noise of the bird, I said, Lord, what is this noise? And he said, this is the bird who awakens from slumber the cocks upon earth. For as men do through the mouth, so the cock does signify, so also does the cock signify to those in the world in his own speech. For the sun is made ready by the angel, and the cock crows. And the phoenix awakens the sun and brings out the sun and all the birds that herald it. Um, and so... Uh, as weird as that might be, you have this giant mystical phoenix bird in the heavens who is like calling forth the birds to call forth the sun that was made ready. Um, but he excretes a worm and the excretion of that worm is cinnamon. And so you have this worm creating these magical spices. And in other folklore, uh, the phoenix is the cinnamon bird or associated very often with these different spices. But I have to think, I don't know for sure about uh, uh, the connection with Frank Herbert. The, those of you who know Dune might immediately be thinking a w magical worm uh, that excretes spice. Isn't that a whole lot like the sandworms in Dune? I think so. So, although the spice is perhaps more interesting in its effect than cinnamon exactly, but I don't know what kind of cinnamon this worm excretes that comes from this phoenix. I think that one's fascinating. There are some more I want to talk about. Um, I wanted to kind of go William Butler Yeats direction with his kind of a deep metaphysical uh, kind of mythology on birds, everything from Leda and the Swan to the the Falcon and the Reeling indignant desert birds in the second coming but but i think that might that's going to keep me from getting to some of the really fascinating ones from norse myth that i want to talk about so let me tell you for a moment about a few of these one is the bird that sits on top of Yggdrasil. Now Yggdrasil is the world tree. It is an actual tree, like a literal tree, but all of the worlds hang upon this from the underworld to the heights of Asgard to Midgard, which is a uh, middle earth or uh, just earth, our world. Um, and atop this tree sits this giant eagle and um in the prose edda uh one of the one of the original source materials of where a lot of norse myth comes from um well it, it's in the poetic edda too but i think it's a lot more accessible in the prose snorri sturlson's version he says um atop of yggdrasil sits an eagle and it is very knowledgeable. And between its eyes sits a hawk and a squirrel. Okay, so this eagle is so huge and it knows so much because it sits atop in the world tree. It's so huge that between its eyes sits a hawk. Um, there's some stories about this hawk, by the way, in the Poetic Edda, uh, which are fascinating. It's this kind of, it's this hell bird. Uh, associated with uh, with the underworld and all sorts of monsters down there. But there's a squirrel that springs up and down the uh, Yggdrasil. His name is Ratatosk, and that means gnaw tooth, essentially. And here's what the squirrel does. 
Uh, so uh, the the prose edda says, a squirrel called Ratatosk springs up and down the ash tree, meaning Yggdrasil, and conveys words of abuse <laughs> exchanged between the eagle and Nidhogg. Uh, Nidhogg is this uh, giant serpent that lies at the roots of the world tree and gnaws on them, and he's this poisonous, evil kind of dragon of the underworld. And so the eagle is at the top of the world tree, Nidhogg, this dragon serpent is at the bottom of it, and the squirrel, Ratatosk, uh, Gnawtooth, uh, springs up and down the world tree, conveying words of abuse <laughs> exchanged between them. And so they're just in the middle of this, like, uh, this um, insult comedy battle. <laughs> I mean, they're roasting each other, and the only way they communicate is through the squirrel that keeps egging it on and keeps it going for who knows how many ages. And and this would have to be a cosmic squirrel, right? If he's able to translate himself through all of the worlds from the highest of the heavens down to the gates of hell and below even the gates of hell down to the very roots of the all existence. And he does so just to exchange words of abuse <laughs> between the two. That's hilarious to me. Oh my goodness. So, um, but another two, a couple of, uh, famous monstrous birds. Maybe I'll end with these two. These are a couple of my favorite. Odin has two ravens or two crows. I think we can interchange them, although um, some ornithologists out there might be upset with me. But Odin has these two ravens named Hunan and Munin. And in general, they perch on his shoulders at night. They fly out across the world during the day. They gather information and they come back and sit on his shoulders and whisper in either ear all the things they have seen so he stays well informed. But an interesting thing about their names is that Hunan translates to thought and Munin translates to memory or remembrance. And so Odin is served by thought itself and memory itself. And he sends those out to gather information about them, uh, about the world for him. I think at least one fascinating feature of, of that set of images is that um, neuroscientists tell me anyway that they everything they can a- account for as comprising uh, intelligence, or maybe I should reverse that and say everything that we know of that is um, what we'd consider the mind or intelligence essentially breaks down to three fundamental areas of the brain um, built to handle three fundamental features. Uh, One of it is remembering things, another is language use, and the third is attention or um, being able to uh, absorb what's going on around you and understand what it is to, to see it and get it. And there's not a whole lot of difference um, that I've, I've known any um, psychiatrist, psychologist, a neuroscientist to mention that differentiates uh, attention from thought or intelligence itself. Um, I've even heard one of them say that, that they can't quite tell the difference, if there even is a difference. And so we have essentially uh, the ability to speak, the ability to remember, the ability to see and to think. And what do we have in Hunan and Munin? But two crows who can whisper all things they see to Odin, they go out and they see things, and one of them is thought itself, and one of them is memory itself. So Odin and his two crows are essentially all the features of the working human mind, all in one beautiful image. I think there are many other aspects of Odin and what he owns and what he has around him that kind of fill a huge gap or uh, can that kind of tell these huge stories that keep layering and layering in complexity. Uh, one of the reasons I'm so fascinated with Odin, uh, but I think that's at least one feature of his birds. But another one that I like a lot 
um, is this is this brief little moment, and this is in the poetic Edda or the Elder Edda, uh, one the the oldest bit of um, the of uh, original source material from which everything we know of to be Norse mythology to be drawn from. Um, there's a moment in the Lay of Grimnir uh, that says, "The whole earth over, every day, hover Hunan and Munin." I dread lest Hunan drop in his flight, yet I fear me still more for Munin. And you have this kind of aging older guy wondering these kinds of things, talking about how the world works. He says, over the whole world, every day, thought and memory fly, Hunan and Munin, these two, uh, Odin's two ravens. Um, and he says that he, he worries uh, that thought will drop away, but what he fears most is losing memory. Isn't that wonderfully kind of sad and deep all at once? Uh, they're more than just ravens, I think, in many ways. Uh, so those were at least a few monstrous birds out of out of Norse mythology. And at this point, if you've made it this far, you've survived another episode of The Monster Professor. So good job. So we've got more to talk about in future episodes, so stay tuned for those. As for this one, I hope you enjoyed listening to some monstrous birds, and I hope you enjoy your turkey day or turkey day week. I'll talk to you next time on The Monster Professor. Monster Professor